Thank you. Can everybody hear me all the way to the back too? When I talk like this? No protests, so okay, I guess. My name is Philip Bayer. I'm going to talk the first half of this talk about crowdsourcing genome wide association studies. Um, here's an overview. First, me until the privacy implications, and after that, Basti. So, first of all, what are genome wide association studies? Um, the purpose of genome wide association studies is to link genetic variants, single nucleotide polymorphisms, to certain traits like eye or hair color or even probabilities to develop diseases like diabetes or certain types of cancer. What is a single nucleotide polymorphism? What you see here is the DNA of two individuals, and a single nucleotide polymorphism means that a single nucleotide is switched between both. The top one is a GC, and the bottom one is a TA, so it's just on one position. And in the lab, if you want to analyze SNPs, you have to use microarrays, which, if you recall high school, are based on the principle that um, DNA strands bind to their antagonists. So what we have here are fixed probes. And in the middle, we have a fully complementary strand binding. And because these probes are labeled with um, fluorescence, you can see the light in the lab. And genome-wide association studies work by basically taking a whole population and then grouping it in two groups. Here we have a healthy person and with a nice head, a carrier of a disease. In this example, let's say it's prostate cancer. So if we split them up, we have the healthy people on the left and the prostate cancer people on the right. And then we check certain SNPs, and the SNPs have um, unique names, always starting with RS and then some number. And because we are diploids, we have two nucleotides at that position. So to the left, you see TT, TG, GG, and to the right, you see GG, GG, TG. And GVAS work by comparing the frequencies then. You can see here our healthy population has TT 30, 33%, 50% TG, and our prostate cancer population has 60% GG. So that's a big difference, and we can link the GG SNP to prostate cancer. And some couple of, of real-life examples. Slidic et al. identified four variants which are linked to heightened resist, risk to develop diabetes type 2. There's a slightly weird study by Colgan et al. which linked one SNP to pro-social behavior. It's not that, it's a bit, how do you say, controversial. <laughs> and big study, good study is from the Wellcome Trust which uh, linked 24 of these SNPs to seven major diseases. So there's always a couple of problems with genome-wide association studies. Here we have, we have to have a large enough sample size we have to correct for multiple testing, and of course, correlation is not always causation. And um, nowadays, GRAS can be used by the private customer, by direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies, um, like for example, 23andMe or DecodeMe. They analyze about a million SNPs and provide a summary of the disease risks together with Ancestry, and it's, it's just 200 bucks, it's not much, it's nothing. There's a couple of the companies doing that, and the n best thing is that they send you the raw data. They don't lock it up from you. Looks, for example, like that. And 23andMe alone has over 100,000 customers, and according to their numbers, 76% of their customers agreed to, to have their data used in research, and 59% of them shared their phenotypic information with the companies. I have to say, phenotypic information is everything that which is describing your body, meaning phenotype could be eye color or risk to develop diabetes or skin color, all of that. And there's research going on in these company labs. 23andMe published a couple of studies with up to 3,000 participants of their um, customers. Uh, on the one hand, they were able to replicate all the studies, which showed that their approach works. And on the other hand, they found a couple of new um, associations for Parkinson. And the problem is that people are sh already sharing their raw data from these DTC companies with other researchers. And um, about 1 to 5% of all customers of 23andMe would, allow, uh, would be able to share their data. They would be okay with that. And there's one project going on, the personal genome project, which is open data, but it's closed participation. So not everybody can 
participate if they even wanted to. And we made a small questionnaire. We asked around 100, uh, 200 people if they wanted to participate or if they wanted to share their data. 68% would share their data, and 26% would share their data, but not with everybody, only with the companies. And only 6% would not share their data at all. And we asked, what, what, what are the reasons for sharing the data? And you can see here, most of them would share because of possible personal benefits, which we'll talk about later again. And most of them wanted to help scientists with their research. And now I give over to Basti. Okay, so um, we are really in favor of doing those open genome-wide association studies, which uh, would allow everybody to uh, do studies on their own so you don't need a large lab and the best thing about it it's already paid for so if individuals get genotyped on their own costs and make the data available to the public we all could use the data for our own research so there are some implications by making our genotypic information public sharing one million markers with the public is uh, problematic for some reasons but there are also p some good positive consequences out of this and we have to warn you, it's, uh, if you think about this, there are possible extreme bad consequences which could arise out of it. So you should really make sure you know what you are doing and if you really want everybody to know about your open data. So on the positive side, first of all, you will gain more knowledge about you. First of all, because if you make your t data available to the public, you will get uh, more people which share the same diseases, share the same phenotypic information like you. And it's just uh, yeah, like uh, patients like me, you get others to share experiences on your diseases or traits. Then it's nice for everybody because it's cheap open science. If you use openly available data for something, you can make nice science without spending a lot of money out of it. And it's not even feasible for trained researchers which have uh, visited universities for a long time, but everybody with an internet access could use such genotyping information for their own projects. And the negative consequences, first of all, it's uh, people might know more about you than you would like them to know. Um, yesterday there was a talk about uh, forensics, how DNA fingerprinting is used by law enforcement agencies. So this is one thing you should uh, keep in mind. Other things are your boss or your next boss might get hold of the data and may use it in things or in uh, ways you won't uh, like them to do so. So you might not get a job or your health insurance company will uh, raise their rates or even not insure you at all because of some genetic information that you will, might develop a risk or have uh, elevated risk factors. Another thing is uh, this knowledge isn't static. Philip said there's one billion markers which are tested, but up to now we only know, have associations for about 30,000 of those markers. So it's nearly still a million left, which we don't know what they are doing, if they are doing anything at all. So even if you are quite informed about what your genetic information right now says, you have no guarantee that not uh, two days from now there will be some publication which, which links SNP666 to some kind of deadly disease you will develop in five years from now, and everybody knows, because you published already your data. So make sure you know about this. And, well, your data is uh, not only informative about you, but also about your next of kin, so your parents and especially your own children will have similar uh, information. So I'll illustrate this on my own example. I've published my data already, and it's, uh, I have this nice AA allele here, and this means I have uh, 1.6 times higher risk for breast cancer, which might not sound that much, but it's uh, nice to know. But this also says that my dad and my mom will have at least one A. And this 1A already means that they will have at least a one point times higher risk for breast cancer as well. And with some more elevated statistics, you can even figure out the frequencies of these uh, alleles in the population and you can get a quite good uh, view on their risk factors as well. So you should make sure that your next of kin might also agree with publishing your data. The same is true if I have a daughter or son someday and uh, yeah, even they will have 1A at least. So Again, you can say if they will develop a disease or not just by me publishing their data, so their consent would be uh, needed as well. So possible solutions to this? Yeah, for future it's hard. So uh, what about laws? Because uh, there are already some laws in place which try to minimize the impact of public 
genetic information. The first is of the United States is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and this is aimed mainly at insurance companies so, and your uh, future employees. So what it basically says is uh, insurance companies or others may not discriminate you because of your genetic information which may be available because they did some hidden testing without your knowledge. But <clears throat> this does not keep, uh, this is only for basic health insurance, so life insurance, for example, could still be denied because of your genetic information. Here in Germany, we have the Gene Diagnostic Gesetz, which is, uh, I think, a bit harder because it basically makes it not that legal to perform those direct-to-customer genetic testing at all. So it's, uh, they sell it here in Germany, but it's still not really clear if they are really allowed to do so. But if you want to get a test, you still can do so. But besides of all these problems and possible inferences with laws, um, we did a platform for those who still want to share. If you are not totally freaked out and say, oh God, those genetic information will kill me, we've built OpenSNP. And what it basically allows you is to upload your data there, your genetic information and phenotypic information as much as you will. And if you are a customer, your benefits out of it is mainly because you get access to really, really many publications or primary literature on genetic information if you're interested in this. For researchers or citizen scientists, it's clear you get data and it's a, a cheap way to get lots of data to use in your own research. So up to then, there was no central repository for open genotypings. There were about 50 people who already uploaded their data to GitHub or SourceForge, if you remember it, um, stuff like this. And uh, you had to uh, do a lots amount of research to find all this data if you wanted to use it, and mostly where there was no uh, phenotypic information about diseases, etc. So, yes, we've created it, and people are using it already. And so what it is, it's really open. It's uh, CC0, so it's basically public domain, all the data in there, so it's... Uh, yeah, genetic information should be not be uh, owned by anybody, we think. So it's really open and can be used for uh, everything you would like to do with it. And yeah, it allows users to annotate phenotypes and it's completely crowdsourced, so we don't make any, uh, yeah, we don't make any suggestions of what you should enter or not. People can go there and say, I would like to know your phenotypic information about SAT scores. So, and people already do enter their test results from high school, basically or on nicotine dependence, hair color, stuff like this, and there's uh, some disease risks, or if there's somebody in the family who develop cancer sometimes. So people are entering this, and everybody can download everything. The only thing that will be kept from everybody is the email addresses and passwords of the users. Besides from this, you can get a complete dump of all the data and perform research with it. And so far, we got 81 genotypings and 20, 207 users. So as we said, we would need 1% at least of uh, 23 million customers, which would be 1,000 users. So we have 8% uh, so far, and the numbers are rising, so we are optimistic that someday we will have enough data to be used in open genome-wide association studies. So to conclude everything, we think GWAS will be the future of personalized medicine because the numbers of customers for direct to consumer genetic testing are rising still. It gets cheaper every year. I think 23andMe started with prices of around 1,000 uh, US dollars five years ago. Now it's uh, 200 euros. So you see the prices are dropping and more and more people will get genotyped and more and more people are willing to share their data as we've seen in our survey. 67% would be willing to share their data. And yeah, it's in the hands of all of us to make or break the situation. So we could make good science out of it or we could publish total crap like Philip said the study on pro-social behavior on this. This was done with 23 people which were genotyped. So the sample size is basically nothing and you shouldn't get published, but somehow they got into pub uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Science in the US so, yeah, we shouldn't do this. And, yeah, we have the chance to take science in our own hands so it gets out of the company vaults where 23andMe sits on this large, large amount of data and the public can't make use of it and other researchers can't use it as well. And so far, we have won the Public Library of Science and Mendeley binary battle with OpenSNP. 
and we've got some funding through the German Wikimedia Foundation. So it's only 5,000 euros, but this would be, I think, 25 um, more people genotyped, which would be public available. And if you're interested in getting genotyped, we will release more details on this in the next year. So yeah, check it out if you want to get genotyped and don't have the money. And yeah, we are constantly improving the project. Currently, we are working on including an API to deliver genetic information using the distributed annotation system, which is widely used in genetics for genome browsers and stuff like this, so others can uh, build third-party tools out of it. And yeah, basically, that's already it. So thanks, and if you have questions regarding privacy and stuff like this, go on. <laughs> So you definitely not a switch in speakers or so? Okay. They said they would do a switch in the speaker. So what anyways. Now Q&A, we have uh, again a microphone here running around and one signal angel sitting in the IRC. And apparently there are already some questions. And uh, before I do the... Uh, before we start with that, again, if you see any Marta bottles, please bring them out. <laughs> yes. So now we can start. The first question I would say from the audience, and then we go over to the IRC. Um, first, thank, thank you for the interesting talk. It um, was an issue I didn't know about anything, so very interesting. Uh, my question, or, or what you... Um, you just make a very short summary, so I think there are lots of aspects we can talk about, but the most interesting for me would be, uh, as you said, um, if I publish my genome, um, I cannot see the effect that it will have in the future because of the research which is coming up, which can also be like, uh, okay, there will be a, uh, theoretically, you can tell me what my intelligence is or whatever, so, um, and, and the much more interesting aspect, I think, is the impact which it would, will have for my children and maybe the children of my children and very much uh, aspects so on. And we had like this discussion about post-privacy also. Um, do you think we will have like in the future, like in, in 100 years, like everybody has a public genome and we will know like every, everything about everybody? It, will this be a possible future or do you think we'll have to go more the way, okay, nobody can publish this? because it's too dangerous. What is your opinion in which direction, basically? Personally, I'd say we're probably landing somewhere in the middle, like people like us publishing it, and there's too much information about you in there, so I don't think that everybody's gonna release it, and it's, it's too, too important for the insurance companies and for your kids and everybody. I don't think we're gonna have all open genomes for everybody. But uh, what do you think? I differ on this because uh, it's, uh, yeah, 10 years ago, the first human genome was published and it cost about 3 billion US dollars and took 10 years. Now you can do it in a week for about 10,000 uh, euros. So, and this price is still dropping at the same rate, basically. It's, uh, Moore's law is uh, slow against it, so we will have the situation where it gets at least affordable. It's not a question of the price, so I think we already see that people get their full uh, genome fully sequenced if they have some kinds of diseases. So it's uh, in medical applications we already do it and up to now we have not figured out how to deal with all the data. So basically it keeps uh, biologists like Philip and me alive and in job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, <clears throat> to have all this data. And I think we will uh, get there that all the data is available. Yeah, but not publicly. Yeah, if it's uh, cheap enough, you uh, can't stop people from just taking a sample of you. We have heard, heard yesterday in the forensics talk how many DNA you are losing yeah, every single second, so I think we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on your website, do you ask for people's names? Or is it important that you have the identity, or could these be anonymous? Oh, most of them are anonymous. You, okay. you don't, we don't, we're not Google, we don't have a real name policy. Okay, so how do you know if the data is real? Do you get it directly from the company somehow? We, okay. we, we have no way to ascertain if the data is real. We can't say, it could be that you upload your sister's stuff or some, from some random stranger, we, we can't. 
Is this much of a concern, or have you thought of systems where you would have a cooperation with one of the companies? Or, uh, it is not yet a concern, of course, but even if we were to work together with a company, I don't know, it's, because then we would get the real names, and we don't need them, we don't want them. Yeah, I think uh, companies will not be willing to give us their data directly, just out of liability and privacy concerns, which was totally... Yeah, it's, uh, I think they won't do it because it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, still a liability risk. They don't want, be, want to get sued because somebody checked a box and didn't really know what he did, so yeah. they might not do it. Um, okay. The authenticity of the data, I think um, there's no uh, benefit from uploading some fake data up to now, so vandalism is not yet a problem that might be someday but I don't see the benefit of vandalizing it, so it's not even fun to upload a fake genotyping. <laughs> uh, how much actually is the uh, equipment of DNA sequencing today? And can a private person uh, buy it on his own? And when will be the time to buy it on his own to have real sort of freedom? I mean, in a sort of, uh, in a way of open source, hardware, DNA sequencing, whatever. There are some projects which are trying to build uh, do-it-yourself biology DNA sequences. They are not really usable for complete genome sequencing yet because they are much too slow and the, basically the chemicals are too expensive to use it yet. So we won't get there so fast, but I think uh, at 23andMe you can already buy a fully sequenced exome of yourself, so it's all the protein encoding regions of your genome for $1,000. So it's, uh, it's, we are getting there. And there are people working on doing it open source. <laughs> We've uh, just uh, two questions for you. Um, one of them is, uh, have you actually looked at any of the DNA forms that are out there, the forms of FTDNA and 23andMe users? Uh, because they're very, very active and they'd be interested in something like this. They often... Um, submit their data to third-party services. Uh, the other thing is I'm a 23andMe and FTDNA customer, and um, one thing I have is uh, for my personal records, uh, I'm keeping all my, uh, all my test results on Google Health at the moment <laughs> because there's nowhere else to store them, and there's no place that I can put my data and give controlled access to it. Is there anything like that on the horizon? What's the last sentence again? What is the uh, there's no place that I can put my test results and my data that uh, I can give somebody else controlled access to them. Uh, for example, I have um, results of my uh, supposed susceptibility to uh, side effects in certain drugs and things, and I can't give my doctor access to that. Not easily, anyway. Yeah. Well, that's why we have the phenotype system, so you can upload your data and enter your phenotype, for example, the susceptibility to the disease you carry. So that... Uh, did you want to say something? <laughs> okay. So that, um, so that the doctor or other researchers researching that disease can then d download your genotype and look at your phenotypes and link, the, link them together. That is, just to reiterate for the stream, that's research, not personalized medicine. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, we're not there yet. Soon, in the next couple of years, five to ten years. And yeah, we are on, active on the 23andMe forums and uh, trying to contact users there who already are sharing. Okay, so I've got a question here. I've got many questions, but um, here's the question. What sort of accuracy can be expected in a personal genome sequencing test? Is the data re repeatable and very verifiable? Hard words. <laughs> we have a wonderful signal angel at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
Um, that, that differs from case to case. Sometimes we've seen studies in our database where we linked SNPs to which were just based on 20 Chinese people or five Europeans. So it's very hard and you always have to look at every, um, you have to look at it from case to case. Um, it's not always verifiable to answer that question. Yeah, the example we've seen was uh, 1.6 times the risk for uh, breast cancer. So this is not really high, but there are some uh, markers which have a yes or no, basically. If you have this variance, you will have uh, the following phenotype. If you have the other, you'll have another phenotype. So there are such hard cases, but they are not frequently found yet. Okay. So another question was, uh, do you plan to offer an open SNP-like platform for other genomes than human, uh, e.g. pigs, mice for university research, or are there already such platforms? We don't plan on doing that, but there's lots of DNA databases for the mice DNA databases, there's everything for everything. We viruses. Viruses, too. What we, what we could do in the future is, like we've already mentioned before, we could make a similar database once exome sequences really takes off, cheap exome sequence, and then we can make a similar project, but we're not, we're not at all focusing on any animals. Yeah, but if you want to do it for other animals, you could do so. The source code is uh, online available, so it's open source. Take it, make it out uh, for pick open snip and go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question is, how much data is there for one person, some GB? It's 30 megabytes? Yeah, it's uh, 25 to 30 megabytes. Well, this is the, uh, just the one million markers. The fully sequenced human genome would have about three billion base pairs instead of one million. So it would get bigger. <laughs> A couple of gigabytes for the full human genome. Hi. It seems you have a um, kind of basically an upload site and a data sharing policy. And where, you know, what I'm really interested in is the API. And when we have exome data, I mean, what are you thinking? Because there you've got the whole problem of novel markers, how you interrogate that data, and that's where it gets interesting. So are you thinking about this problem? What's your plan to get into novel markers, multi-marker associations, and this kind of, you know, genetic material? Yeah, in terms of access, we are currently implementing the distributed annotation system, which allows you to query data for a single chromosome for a specific uh, region in a chromosome, so you don't have to download all the data anymore. This would be of a huge help, and I think this is widely used, and it's a standard, so we will search for this. Um, I think great idea what would be nice is like once you have a lot of users in your database and you have tons of data it would be nice as a researcher to go in and say oh I found these really interesting people but I would like to interrogate them further onto their phenotyping so I'd like to get them back into the lab so if there would be some way I could contact certain people and say you know we found these really interesting variations and we'd be interested to you know take a blood sample or something and compensate you would you be interested in participating in our study which could be anything, and if there would be a way I could contact people through your website that I'm interested in, that would be fantastic. Yeah, we have a small private messaging system, so we can just use that, just to ask the people around. Yeah, and if it's uh, more users, you won't uh, be able that anybody could just click a button and send one million users uh, the same spam message. So if you are interested in sending lots of emails through the system, you, uh, as a researcher, just contact us, so we could do this. Um, so thanks for your nice presentation. I have two questions that are not that related one to the other. So first one is from a data collection perspective. So this is a kind of very sensitive data, right? And under the European Commission legislation that has been transposed into national legislations, you need to have special permissions to kind of, you know, host and share personal sensitive data such as this one. So do you have any yeah, comment on this? How do you handle this? 
Um, also, the, the licensing thing is kind of weird because CC0 has kind of very weird status in, under the European Union legislation. So how do you handle this? I'm just very curious. And the second question is, um, for GWAS, we have very um, few um, studies like where you transpose actually your statistical findings, like the probability that this SNP causes this cancer uh, is this. This SNP explains 0.1% of cancer cases, blah. You have very few studies where actually this is verified in the lab. So how reliable actually is the, the, the information we get here, even if people put their phenotypical data and how reliable is this at the end since we don't have a lab verification? Yep, thanks. Okay, I'll start on the first question is uh, privacy terms and terms of services. We are currently working on implementing a system called We Consent. It's by John Wilbanks, who was the Creative Commons Science Director. And uh, yeah, we are working on this. And the idea is uh, finally there should be an IRB approved, so Institutional Review Board approved uh, form you will have to sign or check and answer questions that you've understood all the terms and services. So this would be the best legal way and we are working on this. And for the second question, that's true. It's really hard to verify that stuff later on. And you can't really, uh, it's not really a death sentence if you see this data in your um, results. So it always, should be always taken with a grain of salt. And if you see it now, it could be completely changed in five, ten years. So it's, it's always moving. So right now, it's, um, I wouldn't trust it 100%. I would wait. Yeah, but I think it's the best we have up to now for a broader audience. So exome or full genome sequencing is still not affordable for everyone. So we could already make use of the data which is available now. OK, one more question. Um, I'm just curious, since this is so sensitive information, um, do you go and educate the users in some kind of way, or do you just rely on the users to uh, educate themselves before they upload their data? When you sign up for the page, there's a long disclaimer where we um, educate the user on the pos possible um, problems. Longer. No, 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 no it's, a, it's human readable, not lawyer readable. Yeah. And when you upload your data, you probably, uh, you're going to see the same disclaimer again. And we also have a, a blog, opensnip.wordpress.com, where we also um, even wrote that a bit longer on the possible problems and risks you go into. Another question anywhere? We have our wonderful video angel. Should I do the front or? You have a microphone, my dear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's late in the evening and I think he's waiting for Jeopardy, but we have so much time so we can have many questions. Uh, if I want to upload my data and I already have some knowledge about an association that I do not want to uh, publish, uh, is it feasible to keep this part of information out? Not really. You could try to redact uh, single snips out of it, but uh, as I said, the knowledge isn't static. You might not know which uh, new association for the same disease might turn up uh, two days from now. So you could try to do so, but it's not guaranteed that it will work. Ah, he's taking over now. <laughs> well, it was said several times, and it's obvious that it's very sensitive data, and uh, it, how, how is it protected against being taken, say, by brute force, be it uh, legal at some point of time, or be it illegal, uh, some people with arms standing in the door and uh, saying, uh, give me your servers. Uh, containing all this uh, genotype and um, phenotype data and uh, users' emails and stuff which may be correlated with uh, clear names and identities. So it's really, really sensitive stuff. But the data is open anyway. We, we don't have to be broken into. But the, the combination with the, with the user identity makes it really crucial. 
Um, to minimize the risk, we, we don't log IPs. We, we don't, you can use fake email addresses, we don't verify that. And the only thing that you probably could, the only thing that's not uh, open is the messaging system. That's the only thing we could lose if we get broken into. So if you, if you use a fake email address and if you, if you don't use the messaging system, then it should not be identifiable. But the problem is, because the data is so, um, the data itself is so singular for yourself, we could identify you again based on that data. And there's no, nothing we can do against that. It's not for research, it's for personalized medicine. So you, you don't have anonymous, um, th this anon anonymity, right? You have just pseudonymity. So if you are sending, receiving and sending back and back and forth, so you have a two-way communication and another party, a third party can rely on that, right? So, and now the trust is broken at one point in time. In, in, in two years from now, or in 100 years from now, but the data is still valid for my grandson or for, for whoever. Um, so, so there's no answer to that problem um, I, that I see right now. Because your grandson is not your clone, his data is probably going to be very, very different from yours. Yeah. yeah, for one quarter, but you're still going to get mixed up data. So even if you now lose all your data, this, you can just you cannot say everything about your grandson. But if my wife if my wife is uploading something too, then you know the half at least of my yeah. grandchildren. So and so on and so on and so on. It's a never ending story, yeah. right? So if you open the box of the Pandora, you never can close it again. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it is already open, so that means it's another bo body's problem then. <laughs> uh, one question from the IRC, apparently. Uh, so here's the question. Is the data format, format for exchange a free one, and which format is it? Right now, we offer all the data in the same format we get it from, meaning that the 23andMe data we offer is in the format that we got from 23andMe. And all the phenotypic data, if you download this, is just a tab delimited CSV. What we are trying to do soon is to make up our own small format for easier parsing of everything. That's got probably going to come sometime next year, early next year. Did you have a question? Some more small comments? You can do that as well. Yeah, fine. Uh, just, just an answer to your question, or just. But I think it's really interesting to, to talk about this philosophical aspect of it or the moral aspect. And I, I mean, one thing you said that is, um, and, I, and I tend to share this opinion that in, in, in the near future we will um, lose our genetic information so fast and so often that we cannot avoid any way to lose it. And uh, a learning from history is that when we lose our information anyway, maybe it's the best idea to open it up to everybody so that at least we as a people have the same opportunity as the governments or the companies or whoever uh, who has the power to take it away anyway. So maybe it's um, just the right idea to make it public in this way. Just an idea. I don't have the clue already, but yet. Uh, you're referring to 19 what? <laughs> uh, would uh, having published uh, this kind of data, if, if the possibility had been then, uh, would have been published the data, uh, say, in Germany in 1935, when there were certain laws uh, about genet genetically related uh, things were made? And I personally would prefer if you would not make a remark about this because else I think the Nazi would have killed me because I have a genetic defect which is quite severe. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, there was one.
fit in, but what you see is the main practical, like, sort of way of reconnecting somebody, someone's identity with the data that they upload, because it doesn't seem very straightforward. It, there could be some third party looking at the, trying to connect an IP address to an upload or something, but say I upload it through Tor, or we have some sophisticated way of uploading data so that you don't know my IP address. What are other ways that you foresee in the future that someone's identity could be reattached to the data that they share? Because it, to me it seems very difficult or like they would have to already have my, all of my DNA anyway, in which case they won't be interested in the data that you have. Um, I think very recent research shows that you need around 70, 75 SNPs to 100 or 99.9% .9 identify a person and because the data set is, is like a million SNPs so I just need a very few of your things, of your SNPs to um, back identify you even if you're anonymous. So that could be a problem in the future. Yeah, I think basically you're right. It's uh, in the future it will be easier not to just uh, intercept somehow your communication with this platform. You will just uh, grab some DNA out of you and uh, do it themselves and get the million markers for themselves. So it might be easier in the future. More questions? Oh, I see. Um, I'm confused about two things. First of all, one of the commenters said this was not uh, uh, mainly for research, but uh, for personalized medicine. As I understood it, uh, it's mostly for research and that uh, users only get something out of this project because if more research is done, they can benefit from this information just as much as everybody else who gets uh, genotype. Maybe could you clarify that uh, what uh, the user gets out of um, the uh, participating uh, in OpenSNP uh, as opposed to just getting their genotyping from a private company like 23andMe. Uh, that's the one thing. The other thing is I, I don't understand the problem. Uh, if somebody like took a hair from me in the street and uh, got my DNA and then could uh, backtrack this to my OpenSNP data, um, they wouldn't get anything from it because they already know who I am and they already got my DNA. So why would it be a problem if they also got my genotyping information from OpenSNP that is already included in my DNA? It's no privacy leak, I think. Okay, let me just answer the first question. Um, when you get your results from your companies, they'll give you a digest of the current research. And what we do basically is we pass three databases. First of all, the Public Library of Science which is um, open access research, then the Mendeley Literature Database, which encompasses most of current research, and SNPedia, which is a um, wiki-like system where people can enter information on SNPs. So what you get as a user is the very, very nearest unchanged research. So you can look at the papers themselves, and you can see what's being done, and you can see what people are thinking about it, other than what um, 23andMe and other companies are telling you about your data. Well, on the side of privacy, what you might get is your phenotypic information, which uh, if you entered some freakish disease stuff which you can't see or you can't uh, tell anyone about, so then you can uh, connect your genotyping information to this phenotypic information, which wouldn't be possible w without uploading it. So I've got a very famous question. It means can the featherhood be looked up from the data? Are you doing that? No. Could you just repeat it? Sorry. Okay. Can the can the can featherhood be looked up from the data? Featherhood. Oh, Sorry. Can people are not doing that because STRs that we had we heard in the talk yesterday is small tandem repeats. Um, it's cheaper and quicker, but I think you can do that. Yes. Okay. It's just not done. Yeah, you usually do this for a wider kinship, so your cousins or uncles or stuff like this, where it's not that easy using STRs. So there are. We are not doing this because we are not really interested in genealogy and uh, kinship relations and stuff. But you can do so, and I think Family Tree DNA is uh, the main provider for genotypings for such reasons. And they do it and have a large database of other people which they can compare you to. Uh, 